If you can find a seat, we're going to start in about 90 seconds. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm David Brown. I want to welcome you, uh, those of you who are here uh, in, the, in the church and those of you who are viewing this online to St. Albans Parish and our memorial lecture for 2022. The St. Albans Endowed Memorial Lecture Fund was established several years ago with a generous gift to help the parish and the wider community examine the pressing issues of our time through the lens of contemporary theology. I'm honored to serve as a member of the Memorial Lecture Series, along with Laura Ingersoll and Gib Kirkham, who are right down here. Uh, and I wanna thank them for their service. And the three of us are available throughout the day to answer questions and offer any assistance that you may need. Um, also, if you have ideas for future topics or future speakers that you'd like to convey to the committee, we're the three people to talk to. So uh, thank you very much and let us know either today or in the coming weeks. We wouldn't be here this morning without the work of both volunteers and staff, beginning with Laura and Gibb. And our staff at St. Albans Parish, led by our rector, Jeffrey Hoare, have fully supported the work of the Memorial uh, Lecture Service Committee. I wanna especially recognize Mary Montenegro, our Director of Communications, who's managed the publicity for today and who's here to coordinate our live streaming. Thank you, Mary. Charles Porter, our Director of Operations, and Doug Dykstra, our Director of Finance, have also supported this series in important ways. And finally, our Sexton, Armando Pineda and his wife, Virginia, do such important work, important and often behind the scenes work, and we couldn't function without them. So we thank all of our staff for the work that they do for us for this weekend and also every, every day at St. Albans. You'll see the volunteers throughout the day, the people who are giving out name tags and making sure that you've got food to eat, thank them. Um, I especially wanna thank our verger, uh, Paul Brewster, for his help with the sound system. And I wanna thank Netch and Leslie for their help in leading the conversations today. Now St. Albans has brought several notable speakers here since the inception of the series in 2018. This year, the committee's delighted to present noted Roman Catholic theologian, priest, and author, James Allison. A number of parishioners have been engaging with James over the past several months through deep study of his book, Jesus the Forgiving Victim. Personally, James's writing has helped shift my perspective around our relationship to God and to other fellow travelers, as well as guidance in moving from a moralistic faith to one of grace and love. The committee believed he would have much to offer us in thinking about today's topic of choosing judgment or joy. As you'll see in your program, James will give his principal address in just a minute. After the mid-morning break, he and Netch will have a conversation expanding on James's remarks. And after lunch, there'll be a more general discussion with James. There are question cards, which Gib has just been passing around to you. Uh, as you listen, if something comes to mind, jot down a question or a note. Uh, our afternoon's moderator, the Reverend Leslie Chadwick, will use them to launch the discussion with James. Thank you again for attending, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Jeffrey to more fully introduce our speaker. Jeffrey. Well, first, let's, let's, uh, let's pray. The Lord be with you. Gracious God, we thank you for this goodly fellowship of faith in which you have called us in your church and in this parish. Thank you for the bonds that unite us. Thank you for all that sustains our life and our common life. We ask your blessing this day that we may receive the gifts you have prepared for us to receive. I ask your blessing on James as he guides us 
in our thinking about our relationship with you, O Lord. For all this we ask and for all this we thank you in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning and thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to have uh, James Allison with us, born just a, just a fraction behind me in 1959. Uh, James grew up in an evangelical household. His father was a minister in Margaret Thatcher's government, but actually was, James will say, much more politically, uh, much more conservative religiously than politically. James' uh, family were very active in uh, All Souls Langham Place, which in those days was run by a a man led by a man of well-known evangelical called John Stott. James grew up in a, therefore, in a world where uh, notable evangelicals, you would have heard of Chuck Colson, you'd have heard of uh, Billy and Ruth Graham, were regular visitors <clears throat> in his home. And, and in many ways, um, in retrospect, he, he would say that it was somewhat like growing up in a cult. So come age 18, um, he... <clears throat> We crossed, actually, James and I crossed our time at Eton College, but did not know each other there. But while, and he was rejecting evangelical Anglicanism while I was embracing it. He became a Roman Catholic at 18. It took me a little longer to leave behind what was, for me, a restrictive, rationalistic system of thought uh, anchored by a doctrine of penal substitutionary salvation, a doctrine that makes not one whit of sense to me today. But uh, we'll come back to that. So a newly minted Roman Catholic, James headed to New College, Oxford, uh, Oxford University. And after a year, uh, he went on a student exchange to Mexico, uh, where he continued his education in Spanish and history, but also, importantly, where he met and joined the Dominican Order in 1981. He finished his novitiate back in England at Blackfriars in Oxford, where, like many of us he in those days, he became aware of the new reality of AIDS, which was formative for him, uh, as it was for many of us uh, along the way. He undertook doctoral work with the Jesuits in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, and was ordained priest in 1988. And it was around that time that he first encountered the work of René Girard, a French cultural critic, um, who lately of Stanford University. He, he describes finding that work as a site of bringing about it for him a seismic shift and was another formative discovery of which we will hear more later today. Completing his doctoral work in 1994, he parted company with the Dominicans in 1995. He'd assented to certain propositions which no longer uh, made sense to him and therefore uh, it, it didn't make sense to, to, to continue with integrity with the order, uh, particularly around what it meant to be gay in the church. James remains a priest, but not one tied to any particular diocese, thanks to the day he received an unexpected telephone call on his cell phone from no, no one other than Pope Francis, who, uh, who we can ask him about in further conversations. James has published two larger works in any number of collections of essays. He's a systematic theologian who has taught and spoken in many countries, often in the language native to those places, speaks many languages. A goodly number of us, as um, David Brown said, have discussed his course on the forgiving victim, listening to the unheard voice, and found it has been a gift to us in many, many ways. Um, he will be, um, we've asked him to talk about moving from judgment to joy, particularly through uh, readings of scripture. Um, those of you who've read his work know that his ability to unpack the scriptures, especially ones that are very familiar to us, is, a, is an extraordinary gift. Um, so with, with that, I'm going to turn this over to my friend and our guest, and our, our privilege to, to listen to, our, to James Allison. So James, where are you? Thank you, Jeffrey. It is a, an honor and a privilege to renew our friendship forged in Atlanta. Hello. Okay, so have I got this thing on? Sorry? Okay, good, good. Oh, well, that's better. I can hear that you, I can, hear that you can hear, so all, all is well. Excellent. Good, good. Well, it's a privilege and a joy to be uh, under the hospitality of Jeffrey, whom I first met many years ago in Atlanta. And I was thrilled to be contacted by him again and asked 
to come here. So thank you very, very much indeed for making, uh, making this possible. The, uh, the St. Albans Memorial Committee asked me to address this, sub this topic, choosing judgment or joy, helping people of faith move from anger to love. And as we got closer to the time, and I entered my usual panic uh, as to how I should do this, especially when I talked to them over a Zoom and they were telling me more about what they wanted me to, to talk about, um, I realized that the gospel for tomorrow is the parable of the prodigal son. And of course, I don't get much of a chance to talk for any length, especially as a, a priest or preacher who, with a strong tendency to verberia, um, the, one has a very limited uh, speech time on the Sunday, so I thought to myself, let's have a longer look at a parable that has everything to do with joy, judgment, and anger. And let's see whether this helps nudge us along a little bit. So, I hope you all have a copy of the two, the two pages of this. I've put in the Greek um, merely to show off my computer skills, uh, but also so that you can, when I, when I say ludicrous things, you can say, oh, he's not making this up, as you all refer instantly to your uh, native, native Greek. Um, <laughs> uh, we're going to read through that slowly, but before we do, I just want to bring out a couple of initial points about the whole notion of a parable because that's actually rather an important point when it comes to moving on from anything. I don't know whether you shared my upbringing in these matters, but we were told that Jesus' parables were brilliant pieces of repartee which Jesus came up with to uh, kind of spike the wicked Pharisees and Sadducees or whoever was the, uh, the baddie du jour. Um, uh, and that he came up with these brilliant retorts which the, uh, the pure and simple were able to understand and rejoiced and everybody else went away frustrated. Does that, does that sound familiar? Is that, is that <laughs> okay, this is what I call the wild E. Coyote theory of the gospel, <laughs> where Jesus is the roadrunner and the Pharisees and a whole lot of other bearded weirdos are, uh, are the uh, wily e. Coyote, and they're forever setting up traps for Jesus and he's forever causing acme anvils to fall on them. <laughs> so this would be an acme anvil. Um, and I want to say that's a completely hopeless way of understanding uh, the parables. Um, I'd like to suggest to you that one of the reasons Jesus taught in parables was because it is not the kind of address that I am giving you. That's to say, a talk from somebody in a position who is above looking down at you <laughs> and addressing you as someone who knows, okay? The whole point of the parabolic method is that it avoids that. That is tremendously important. If what you're saying to people runs the risk of causing you to enter into rivalry with them, and therefore the one thing you don't want to do is to be the person who has got it right, putting right people who have got it wrong. Uh, that's a very convenient way of, of speaking, and we preachers do it an awful lot. You know, hear me out here. You know. um, but that's not what this is about. The parabolic method, the example I use uh, to try and describe it, I don't know whether any of you, or the Jeffrey who shares something of my uh, geographical and temporal background, will remember, but there was a toy when I was growing up that was a Swedish wood ball puzzle a bit like a Rubik cube, which you had here. And it was a ball, a sphere, made of wood, but which contained lots of pieces of wood. And as a ball, it looked perfectly splendid, and it was perfectly clear that you were supposed to take apart the wooden pieces. And once you'd taken it apart, you would have thought, oh, how easy it will be to put together again. And then, of course, it was absolutely impossible to put together again. <laughs> and you struggled for a long time to get the right pieces in the right order, but once you've done it, you've got a great sense of satisfaction. You had done it. <laughs> you had solved the puzzle and the thing looked beautiful again. Now, I would like to suggest to you that a parable is rather like that. Starting with the word parabolo, it's 
sort of throwing forward or throwing beside. The idea being that rather than my lecturing to you, I'm throwing something into your midst, something that you recognize. And we'll have a look at people's recognition of the parable. And then you start to unpick the pieces that you recognize, convinced that you're going to know how it all goes together <laughs> again. And then, whoops, you can't quite work out how it goes together. So you then have to do the hard work of putting it together. But as you do so, you discover what it means for yourself. And it's not me who's told you. It's you who's worked it out. You know it from the inside. Do you see why that is a particularly uh, interesting way of teaching and avoiding rivalry at the same time? So I'd like to suggest to you, uh, keep that image in mind as we try to work through what's going on in a parable. The second little point, which is that Jesus didn't pluck his parables out of thin air. He made references to things which may seem erudite to us, but were not at all erudite to the people with whom he was speaking. On the contrary, he could count on a very rich background, not only of shared stories, but of shared verbal references. Remember, people will have been much more in an oral culture, even when they could read, than in a reading culture. So certain words will have conjured up certain pictures because they will have been phrases they heard before. They will have known how to end certain sentences because they had heard them frequently or had to learn them by heart and recited them. So, as I say, we will listen to some things that may sound, uh, uh, may sound erudite to us but are not. They are part of familiar stories. They're part of a familiar verbal and pictorial background. And it's in the midst of that that Jesus is offering them the Swedish wood puzzle ball. And thirdly, we know something about how St. Luke was making use of the lectionary cycle that was available at the time. There was a basic lectionary cycle in the, uh, uh, what we would now call the Jewish world, but at that stage was probably still the Hebrew world, in which, let's remember, at the time of Jesus, the word Jew did not have its modern ethnic sense. It was still more, more that of a religious partisan group within the broader ethnic group would have been known as the Hebrews. It was beginning to acquire that sense, but it didn't really get that sense until about a century later. About a century later, it starts to have the, uh, a sense closer to our modern ethnic uh, a sense of a particular group. But at this time, not quite yet. But they did have certain uh, lectionary cycles for certain feasts. And curiously enough, the cycle of the feast, uh, the, the lectionary cycle for the feast of the uh, foundation or refoundation of the temple appear to be in the background to these texts. It included readings from the book of Deuteronomy. It included readings from the book of Genesis. And it included readings from the book of Malachi. Famously, the Malachi was the notion of the end of Malachi is the notion of fathers being turned towards their children and children being turned towards their fathers. You remember that those rather beautiful lines from the end of uh, the book of Malachi. But this was the celebration of the refoundation of the temple as a feast of the coming together of the tribes of Joseph and Judah, or the children of Joseph and Judah. So it was the feast of a celebration the coming together of the temple was something made possible by peace amongst the tribes. That was one of the key things that was celebrated. It appears that something of that is in the background to this story. Having said that, you don't really need to remember that again until the end. The little hints of it will appear. Now we get to look at the rather fun elements of the story. So, 
You'll remember that this passage appears in St. Luke's Gospel in chapter 15, and it's preceded by two other parables. And we can tell that the three parables are on the same line because each one of them has the same punchline. And the punchline is, party! <laughs> that is literally the punchline to each one of them. If you remember, parable number one is there are, the shepherd has a hundred sheep, 99 stay put, one goes astray, he goes off in search of the one, comes back and then says, party! One that was lost was being found, let's have a party. Parable number two, numbers getting smaller, a widow has ten coins, she loses one, leaves the nine safe, goes off, finds, finds one, rushes home and says, party! Uh, because she's, that which was lost has been found. So, guess what? Uh, it's a good, a good uh, line of thought is that probably the punchline of this one is going to be party! And that's quite important because over time we've separated this parable from its place in St. Luke's Gospel and we tend to have a moralistic and penitential reading of it. And I hope to show you that the moralistic or penitential reading of it is not in the text, despite what, <laughs> despite our custom. But that what is very strongly in the text is party, and we'll get to that. But I just want to remind you that Luke gives us a strong hint of how he wants us to, uh, to take this. So, let's, uh, let's start away. So, Jesus is talking to people who are upset that he was eating with uh, sinners. So this is the third of these party stories, and Jesus says, there was a man who had two sons. Okay, good beginning to a story. There are plenty of stories in the Hebrew Scriptures of a man with two sons. Please notice that in the Hebrew Scriptures and in the story, uh, all of this is very sexist. Uh, we have to reimagine it. Uh, in a less sexist way, but you don't need to read very hard into all the background texts that Jesus is commenting on to notice that this is a, a male-structured world. So the younger of these two says to his father, give me the share of property that will belong to me. Okay, so we have two sons and we have a property problem. <laughs> well, luckily the book of Deuteronomy was very clear on this. The book of Deuteronomy uh, there's a passage which is to do with uh, how you divide up property. And it's absolutely clear. It presumes a man having two sons, and it presumes that the elder one gets two-thirds, and the younger one gets one-third. Okay? Not very far from that chapter is another chapter about what to do with a rebellious son. What to do? Oh, yes, that's nice. Take him out of town and stone him. <laughs> so, uh, none of this... Remember, all of these resonances would have, been, uh, would have been quite clear. So, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. Now, it's not clear whether Hebrew law at the time had a place for anticipating wills. Uh, we don't know, therefore, whether this was the equivalent of saying to his father, listen, I, 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 offer, I wish to anticipate your death, um, but uh, give me the property now. But the chances are it would have at least been a shaming thing someone who was not prepared to, to put up with their father running their property. But what does the father do? And this, I suggest, is the first surprise in this passage. Most of us, when we remember this story, think, oh yes, the father gave him his property, his share. So his share is the one-third. And we imagine that the father then hangs on to the other two-thirds. No, that's not what it says. So he divided his property between them. How much property did he have after this? Good, thank you. This, this is the parable of the self-effacing father. And that's hugely important because that would be a very good Jewish move in talking about God. Very, very important. He divided his property between them, and that's going to be very important later in the story. At this stage, the father is a decorative extra to his family's property. 
no doubt allowed to live off the interests, but formally speaking, the property is no longer his. It now belongs to the two sons. And note that the father is not in any way uh, perplexed or disgruntled or offended by this. He's very happily just done it. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had. Well, gathering all you had was not like you know, packing a few sports trophies into your rucksack um, and wandering off on a you know, worldwide tour. No, gathering all you had at that time meant making your asset liquid, which would have meant property sales and complications. One of the things it would certainly have meant was that all the neighbors got to know that not all is well in the X household. Uh, this is a shameful matter when the son is having the property liquidated so that he can go off. In other words, the reputation of the father would not have been high as people came to know what was going on here. So he gathered all he had and travelled to a distant country. Ah, the very mention of a distant country will have immediately conjured up images. We're talking about the bits of our Swedish wood puzzle. The distant country was usually Egypt. That tended to stand in for the distant country, and we are not wrong to think of that. Egypt will appear as the backdrop in a lot of this parable. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. What did he squander his property on? Most of us remember the older brother's accusation. On whores spent the other way, spelt the other way. But no, that's not what it says. That's the brother's nasty accusation. It just said spent property in dissolute living. Actually, the Greek word asotos suggests that he was just spendthrift. He was just not good with money. And incidentally, that would have been a, a bad sign. One of the things that was expected at the time, a good Jewish boy who'd gone away from home on a business trip was expected to bring home profit. That was something that was, was quite seriously important for family honor. Squandered his profit in his property in, in a spendthrift and spendthrift living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. Okay. Distant country, famine, Egypt. We all remember the stories. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. Okay, so here we have the, the descent into impurity. Everything is now bad. He's had to put up with things that were not impure uh, in the distant country were certainly uh, the ultimate shame for him. He's now deeply ashamed. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. In other words, he's reached, he's reached so much the shame phase that he would wouldn't even have thought it wrong to eat the pods that the pigs were eating. No one gave him anything. And then it said, but coming to himself. It's interesting that many of us have in the back of mind that this is some sort of repentance story. But coming to yourself is much more a waking up and notice, noticing what's going on story. It's not a Oh, I have got everything terribly wrong. No, he says, what the F am I doing here? <laughs> I've got myself into this situation. Let me see how I can get myself out of it. So he says, how many of my father's hard hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. So he still imagines his father as having servants, even though his father has actually given away everything. But here I am dying of hunger. In other words, this is a purely... A reasoned piece of thinking. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hard hands. Okay, I will get up and go to my father. There's a little pun here. I will arise and go to my father. Uh, is the or my father's place, my father's house, is what Solomon says after King David has died, arising I will go to my father's house, when uh, 
he's about to inaugurate the temple with a fantastic sacrifice which will include slaughtering a huge number of bullocks. But we'll get to that. So Solomon is being quoted here. He's arising going to his father's place. But what is it that this lad is going to say to his father? Well, we think, how splendid. Yes, he's saying, sorry, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And in fact, this phrase was the phrase that appears in the uh, rite of the atonement, at least as we know it from about 100 years after this time, through a book called Mishnah Yoma. This is the equivalent of what we say at the beginning of the Eucharist, uh, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my sisters and brothers. It was that phrase. But the really interesting thing is that it in fact is a direct quote from Holy Scripture. And I wonder whether any of you can remember who says the equivalent of, I have sinned against heaven and against you, which is being quoted here from Holy Scripture. I doubt whether I can remember it. The answer is, it's Pharaoh. And it's a joke. Or rather, it's not a joke, it's a, it's a piece of cynicism on the part of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is getting pretty fed up with Moses' magic tricks, or Aaron's magic tricks, being better than his own magician's magic tricks. So uh, Pharaoh decides he needs to go all humble before Moses uh, uh, in a desperate bid to try to get him to stop the, the magic trickery. Um, so he says, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And guess what? It's fake. <laughs> it's a, I've got to jump hoops in order to persuade you, to manipulate you. It's a fake confession. That's the scriptural reference to this passage. So what is the son doing here? He's saying, I need to come all over humble. <laughs> Needs to pretend that that's what I'm going to do in order to convince you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hard hands. No longer worthy to be called your son. That's perfectly easy. He's lost all his property anyhow. So treat me like one of your hard hands. At least give me a quality of employment conditions. But please notice, this is only ironically penitential. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And this, of course, is the, the wonderful key central line, which we all remember, as the beautiful uh, moment when the father, who's seen him from afar, rushes and brings him back. Let's just think of the physicality of it. Um, if you are a, a portly Middle Eastern patriarch, uh, running anywhere is distinctly, um, let's say, infra dig. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not you at your best picking up your skirt and hopping down the, uh, the street. You had, you had boys and servants to do that for you. So him running is already yet another example of the father behaving in the most unpatriarchal way imaginable. There are not bad reasons why he might want to get to the edge of the city town before his son gets there, because if he gets to the edge of, his, of the, uh, the city afterwards, the people at the city gate might have deduced that this guy had come back without having made a fortune, and they might have engaged in the formal act of ostracism, since there was a way in which you told somebody to go away. There was a formal act of ostracism called the mezaza, which basically involved shaking some nuts. And uh, that was a way of saying, it can't come back here. Or they might have treated him as a rebellious son and gone and stoned him. So not, none of these are, uh, were good options. So the father rushing to the, the city gates is a, it's self-demeaning, part of his self-effacement, and B, it's quite an emergency uh, operation. But more important than that is that, again, these lines, he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him, is a triple direct quote from Scripture. This happens three times in Scripture, and each one is important. The first time it happens, Esau rushes and falls on Jacob's neck and embraces him. I can't, don't know whether you remember, but Jacob had uh, uh, cheated Esau, who was his elder brother, out of 
his birthright. And now that Jacob and Esau, who both since become very, very, very rich men with acres of cattle and sheep and everything else you can think of, now they were going to come close to each other and meet each other. And Jacob was very frightened. He knew his brother had good reason to take vengeance on him. So he gets, uh, first of all, he wrestles with, with God in, uh, uh, in, a, in a brook and gets sciatica for his, uh, uh, for his reward um, and uh, then sees God and is called, the place is called Peniel, the, the faces, the faces. Uh, and he's learned to, to look at the face. And the Hebrew text is very clever because shortly thereafter he sees the face of his brother. So the Hebrew text in Genesis knows that seeing the face of God is the same as seeing the face of the brother. It's very remarkable how the verbal resonance is deliberate there. But anyhow, at this stage, Jacob is frightened. He knows that Esau is coming close. So he sends out, you know, troops of sheep and then goats and dancing girls and dancing boys and wives and extra wives and camels and then himself all as presents to, to Big Bro in case he's wrath. But Esau olympically ignores all of that and comes rushing and falls, rams, and puts his arms around him and kisses him. So please notice the first reference is an elder brother behaving in a completely gracious and forgiving way to a younger brother. Okay. Second reference is to the Joseph story. So we're still the same family generation further down. Joseph, when Benjamin is brought, uh, is brought back, goes out, receives him, falls on his neck and kisses him. Again, older brother, younger brother. And the third story is, the third moment is the Joseph again. This time, when his father is brought down to Egypt. Joseph sees him from afar off, goes into Goshen or whatever the place in between Egypt and uh, whatever the place between Egypt and, and Canaan was called at that time, and falls on his neck and kisses him. So it is a son falling on a father's neck. In no case at all is it a father falling on a son's neck. <laughs> these, are the, these are the curious bits of the, oh, we know that, that's... That's a piece of the puzzle we know, but how odd. It's the wrong way around. Yes, that's how this thing works. So he's filled with compassion, and he acts like an elder brother loving a younger brother, or an elder brother loving an errant father. So, once they're together, the son says to him, he trots out his fake repentance line. Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called son. Now, please note, he doesn't even get to say the second part. He's caught midstream by the father. And please notice there's something very weird here. weird here. The father doesn't even address him. The father just cuts him off, you know, <laughs> all this penitence, lots of... <laughs> I know that's completely fake. I don't give a toss about that. That's not really what we're here. So the father speaks to the slaves, the servants. Quickly bring out a robe, the best one. And put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Okay, a robe that would have been, remember that in the Joseph story, it all started with a robe. <laughs> but also there is the account of how Moses ordained Aaron, a priest, putting the robe and the ring on him. An elder brother, sorry, a younger brother ordaining an elder brother because Aaron was Moses' elder brother. Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. It was also how Pharaoh, the good dad, treated Joseph. Because of the Joseph story, Pharaoh is the ultimate good dad, completely self-effacing and without rivalry with Joseph. Even when Jacob comes along, Pharaoh, rather than going into a hissy fit and saying, no, 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 now his real family's turned up, now I'm going to be turned into a secondary father figure. Doesn't, uh, doesn't get worked up about that at all. He said, no, how splendid. Let me offer them some territory so that they can pasture their sheep. So the good dad is being signalized here, the, 
another self-effacing father. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. The suggestion that this figure is a priestly figure, like Solomon inaugurating the temple in the robe and with the ring, and that they're going to slaughter and have the great celebration that would be the inauguration of the temple. Remember the, the texts, the liturgical texts for the feast of the inauguration of the temple. Get the fatted calf and kill it, let's eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So, party. <laughs> That's the father's concern. The, he cuts off the son speaking, if the son was even there to speak. Because that's left in doubt. He doesn't appear again at all. And immediately starts the party. Part two. Mm -hmm. Now the elder son was in the field. That's a very strong reminder of a certain passage in the book of Genesis when a certain elder brother lured a younger brother to the field, an elder brother who was jealous of his younger brother, and killed him. Yes, Cain makes his appearance. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. In other words, party. So he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. One of the servants, it doesn't have to have been a slave, it was, could have been a servant and asked what was going on. And he replied, and my guess is that if you didn't look at your text now, most of you would transliterate the next response as, your brother has returned. But that's not what it says. And it's quite important that it doesn't say that because the Hebrew for return was a synonym for repentance. It says, your brother has come. And it's a direct reference to another party in the Joseph story. Because I hope you're noticing something that Joseph is, appears quite frequently uh, here. It's a reference to another part in the Joseph story. In the Joseph story, when Joseph's brothers have all come back and Joseph has finally revealed himself to them, they start to have a party. In fact, they make such a row that they uh, create too much noise for Pharaoh and his household to sleep. So Pharaoh, or someone in Pharaoh's household, sends a messenger to the house where the brothers are staying and says, what's going on? And the servant says, his brothers have come. It's exactly the same. The only difference is the, the singular or the plural. Brothers have come. And then, of course, Pharaoh is perfectly happy and everyone is happy that there is a party. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. So that's the, the explanation is being given. Then he, that's the older brother, became angry. So here we have the first mention of anger. The anger is related to jealousy. It's linked to the Cain and Abel story. Something has been sacrificed and pleasure is being had. That was what upset Cain in the first place. God seemed to be pleased with Abel's sacrifice. He became angry and refused to go in. At this stage, our self-effacing father behaves even more abominably than before. Again, the patriarch at a party does not come out. At the most, he would send the brother out, except the brother seems to have disappeared or not to have been there. He seems somehow to have been consumed in the, in the whole thing. But then he would have sent servants out. We knew there were servants there because one of them has just spoken, telling the brother to come in. But no, he comes out himself. Again, completely self-effacing, self-demeaning, comes out at a level that makes him below the elder brother. He's now speaking to him 
as someone too lowly to be a clear interlocutor. But so the older brother answers his father, listen. Okay, so already speaking to him as a superior. For all these years, I've been working like a slave for you. and I've never disobeyed your command. I have slaved, I have served you, and never one of your commands have I let go. And that's the standard uh, term for not uh, loosing one of the commandments, one of the very many commandments. In other words, he's saying, I have been strictly observant. It's not only with reference to uh, obeying someone with relation to agriculture, but it's, it's the the Hebrew way of referring to God. This is what an, how an observant Jew would answer a question about his worthiness to take part in a sacrificial festivity. I've never let go of one of your commandments, yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. So Cain, jealous somewhat, remember, was upset that Abel's sacrifice worked and he, Cain, who was a horticulturalist, <laughs> wasn't allowed, wasn't considered worthy. But then, note, he addresses with great superiority this self-demeaning figure. But when this son of yours, what he does not say is, my brother, <laughs> this son of yours, he refuses to recognize his similarity with this other person who has devoured your property with prostitutes. Yeah, it could be that. That's his view on what his brother has been up to. That's a particular interpretation of what his brother has been up to. Though the same phrase in Greek might mean who has eaten your life amongst idolaters, which was a way of referring to the high priest's uh, eating the life of the sacrifice, the gnawing the part of the Lord, the portion of the Lord, which was the viscera of the lamb. Rather nasty business, really, if you think about it. I'm glad that we modern priests don't have to do that. Um, gnawing raw lamb with a little bit of vinegar, uh, that was the portion of the Lord, which is why the Lord is described as being viscerally moved. Hence, the father coming out was filled with compassion. The Greek is, was viscerally moved. That's why viscerally moved in Greek is always a God word, because it refers to the portion of the Lord, God being moved in the viscera. So this phrase could mean, he has eaten your life, meaning he has performed the sacrifice amongst idolaters. But who cares? This is the brother being, being jealous. And you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, and our translation misleads, because it says son. And actually, the uh, Greek says technon, which literally is offspring or child. It's a tender word, but it's quite important that it not be the word son, as we will see. He said to him, child. You are always with me. He brings to mind the fact that, in fact, all that property has been his all along. The whole problem with this guy is that he didn't realize he'd already been given his, his portion. It's been his all along. And he has held it resentfully as though it was something that he needed to make obediences to get right. And he was somehow being withheld something from it. But all of this was his anyhow. Remember the two-thirds he'd been given at the beginning. All that is mine is yours. Normally, we read that as a kind of nice metaphor for... I'm, I'm really a kind guy, you can trust me to be generous. But he actually means it quite literally. Literally, it's yours. 
has been from the beginning. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found, which is the quote from uh, the book of Genesis when Jacob is told, Jacob Israel is told by his sons that Joseph <laughs> is alive. So all of this would have conjured up those passages. I hope you see that it's a, a rather interesting story. It's not so much penitential, it's the build-up to the question of how brothers can celebrate together. What does it look like to be able to enter into the celebration? And here's the first weird point at the end. It's a, par it's a, it's a parable unlike most parables, which does not end. At this point, there is no resolution. It's an open-ended question. Will the elder brother accept the invitation? I hope you can see that what Jesus is doing is trying to enable the people who were furious that Jesus was going in and eating with sinners to say, he's trying to say, can you find yourself on the inside of this story and maybe see your way into the party? If you work out for yourself what's going on in all those Hebrew stories about fathers and brothers, <laughs> which you know about, but are you going to be able to find your way into the party? Are you going to be able to respond to the only must, the only real command here, we had to celebrate. It was necessary. The only real command here is the command to party. Quite literally. The suggestion is that quite literally the only thing the Heavenly Father is interested is brothers being reconciled and being able to party. Does not give a toss about what they have been up to, provided they can be reconciled and have a party. That's what makes it, in a sense, such a weird Lenten piece. <laughs> because we are so used to reading it in the penitential mode. But in fact, it's, if there is a penitential question, it's how do we undo our refusal to attend each other's parties? <laughs> and that, it seems to me, is where we're coming close to what, as I understand it, your memorial board wanted us to begin to look at. <laughs> Uh, in the questions. And of course, it is a question that I'm ill prepared to answer for you, but I hope we can answer together. One of the things that I've noticed about how we refuse to enter each other's parties is the relation of shame to all this. What's the attitude of the, the party-refusing elder brother? The party-refusing younger brother, he hid his shame by just wanting to get through the, jump the, through the hoops of, of being penitent. His shame was very, very great. He learned how to try and say something, and he was caught by surprise that his, the father really isn't interested in all that and just wants to see him flourish. And that the whole point of the temple is that. But what about the elder brother? Because most of us at some stage in our lives are a strange mixture of the two. The, both the elder and the younger brother or sister dwell in us. How do these become reconciled? The elder son, the person who was classically good 
but, at least according to this story, unnecessarily good and resentfully good. What kind of goodness is it that is resentful? Being right seems to have been tremendously important. But being right without realizing what he had been given. The realizing what he had been given might have made him more relaxed, for instance, about having a goat party every now and then. <laughs> Rather than regarding the world as somehow withholding things from him causing him, making demands on him, but withholding things from him. But please notice, neither of these brothers gets it right, and neither is admirable. It's not a question of one being good and the other being bad. They're both rather hopeless, really. One is just not very good with money, and the other is too good with money. One is good at pretending to be sorry. The other can't bring himself to imagine being sorry. How does shame work like that in our society? I've, one thing I've noticed as we've d dwelt over the last five, six, seven, eight years with the twin mysteries of Brexit and MAGA and now Putin world, in our midst, is how these same forms of righteousness and unrighteousness come back into the discussion. We have impenitent righteous people and apparently unrighteous people with little hints of penitence held on to defensively. What is woke but bits of genuine truth held as weapons. What is anti-woke, but impenitence dressed up as self-righteousness. What is either of them missing? That we only know what is righteous within being forgiven together and brought to a place where we can share a party together. And that means allowing our shame to be reached. One of the cruelest forms of Christianity, it seems to me, is the one which stresses the forgiveness of sins as being something objective if you say the right words and go through the right hoops. Whether it's in a Catholic quasi-sacramental form or a Protestant belief in imputation form. Because neither of those reaches shame. And it seems to me that if Jesus came in our midst to enable us to have a party, and he did so by dying in our midst, it wasn't to pay a price, it was to occupy a space. And occupying the space in our midst that enables us to begin to accept our shame. Our shame is the sort of people who participate in such things, receive the benefits from such things, and yet don't want to allow ourselves to be invited into the party. But being invited into the party means actually allowing our shame to be held with tenderness. Shame held with tenderness is an increased form of empathy towards apparently unshameable sisters or brothers. It's the ability to imagine that they too might be hiding their shame in strange and unpredictable ways. And that if we are able to sit together around the presence of, around the table of, the one who occupies the place of shame. It's my favorite verse from the New Testament. For the joy that was 
set before him, he endured the cross, thought of as nothing the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. If we are unable to dwell in that space, how might that enable us to begin to see who our sisters and brothers are and how we might accept the invitation to enter the party? Thank you very much. take our break uh, a little early and come back at um, at 11 well we have the live stream uh, scheduled for 11:15 so we better stick to that um, have coffee chat with James chat with one another and we'll see you back at 11:15 and also we have question cards uh, that Gib has, uh, if you'd like to take those and um, think about anything that uh, came to mind that you'd like uh, James to expand on uh, in the discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that wasn't much too short. But, but, um, it was, but, but that's okay. What, what's the time? What time? It's 10.30. Oh, I see. So, um, so it was about 40 minutes worth of, 45 minutes worth of short. Okay, I'm sorry, that was, that was too short. But because we're live streaming the people. Right. So we'll stick to the Stick schedule. to the schedule. Right. So, uh, you know, feel free to uh, go and have some something more to eat. Yeah. I'm sure uh, people will engage you in this. Uh, yeah. I've turned the mic off, so we're...
Please take your seats. And we need Netch. If anyone has trouble hearing, you might consider moving farther forward. The speakers have microphones, but still. It now is. Are we okay? asked to invite everybody forward to the extent that you're comfortable coming forward. I know that that is anathema to Episcopalians, but nevertheless, do come forward if you're so inclined. Now, I begin by accusing the rector of theft, because when we had lunch yesterday, I indicated that one of the things I like uh, is the telling of our stories, that it's a Christian practice, and that I was going to begin my interview of our wonderful guest here by getting him to tell his story. And the rector gets up and tells his story. <laughs> so I'm going to proceed anyway. <laughs> so you tiptoed through the tulips from Eton College to the academic climbs of Oxford and then down to Mexico, and then back to the UK, and then, strangely, off to Brazil. And in the course of all of that, your interior spirituality must have been quite an adventure, uh, and we're interested. So to the extent that you want to share what was going on in your life, you know, from joining a religious organism, a religious community, and then becoming ordained, and with the controversy surrounding some of that, and then your decision to sit down, nevertheless, and construct uh, a marvelous and very highly regarded uh, uh, theological system. Uh, and then finally, what, what is a power of the keys? Aha. Uh -huh. Which the Pope delivered to you. Yes. So, to the extent that you want to share anything about this, why? Well, shall we start with the power of the keys? Fine. Um, and then I'll fill you in the back. Yeah, the power of the keys is rather fun. Um, if the Pope rang you up and told you that he was giving you the power of the keys, what would you think? Sorry? Party, yeah, okay, that's I deserve that. <laughs> I deserve that. Um, well, uh, he asked me, he said, I give you the power of the keys. Do you understand? I give you the power of the keys. And he repeated it twice. So presumably he understood that I didn't understand, even though I said yes. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I've since found out that what it means, and uh, excuse me if I then now speak a little bit of uh, Catholic speak to you. Uh, in, the, in the Catholic setup, the, one of the features of the Pope is that he's known as the universal ordinary. An, ordin an ordinary, in Catholic terms, is basically a bishop. The bishop who has the orders, the power of orders, in a particular diocese is known as an ordinary. Is that, is that a term in which Episcopalians use to refer to your bishop? Yeah. We have the canon to the ordinary here. You have the canon, right. Who serves the bishop. Ah. Okay, but so in, in the Catholic setup, the ordinary is a bishop, so every Catholic lives in a diocese of one sort or other. But since Vatican I, the First Vatican Council, uh, the assumption is that every Catholic is uh, under an ordinary, or in a diocese over which an ordinary presides, an ordinary is supposed to establish the use of orders so that worship can be appropriately given to God in the diocese in question, 
but that every Catholic also has an immediate relationship with the universal ordinary, in other words, the Bishop of Rome. Um, so you have a, a twin relationship, theoretically, with a bishop and with the universal ordinary. Of course, it's very rare that the uh, individual relationship with the universal ordinary gets activated. <laughs> and I'm one of the very few people I know where it has been. Um, and this was, in the re this was really uh, the resolution to a, a saga of uh, um, a cardinal in Sao Paulo um, trying to get rid of me from the priesthood. Uh, not for anything terribly clear. I think that he was irritated that I was celebrating masses for the local gay and lesbian uh, group which I'd helped to found but because the Archdiocese of Sao Paulo didn't have any uh, LGBT pastoral. And it seemed to me a good idea that there should be one. And since he didn't answer my letter when I wrote to him to tell him that I was going to do such a thing, it seemed to me uh, that it's better to just go ahead and do it. Um, and, and I'm glad to say that the, the Pope, who wasn't Pope at the time but became Pope later, famously is of the opinion it's better to ask forgiveness than to ask permission. This is, this is a, good, this is a good, uh, good principle in life, better to ask forgiveness than to ask permission. So anyhow, I, I went ahead with this. But um, eventually, he, the uh, cardinal in question got a little snippy um, uh, about all this. And I don't know. I, I don't know exactly why. But anyhow, he felt he needed to get rid of me from the priesthood. Um, he eventually managed to find an excuse in canon law for doing that. Because theoretically, unless a priest has been a very naughty boy, I mean, I mean genuinely done something terribly wrong, which would obviously include child abuse, which would include... Um, taking money for sacraments uh, uh, improperly, uh, rank heresy of stealing the parish, um, uh, whatever it is, uh, funds, all of which happens, believe me. Um, but uh, you do need a charge of some sort to be able to uh, remove someone from the priesthood. And, and curiously enough, celebrating mass for gay and lesbian people does not count as uh, the kind of thing that that is a chargeable in that sphere. But anyhow, so he felt he needed, he managed to find some pretext in canon law of which I was never informed. Um, he managed to conduct a case that uh, was to me the emotional equivalent of receiving a, a document saying, we, the authorities of the Bolivian Navy, have decided to reduce you from the rank of admiral to mere captain, which is interesting if you thought you were a member of the Bolivian Navy. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's an entirely self-referential uh, entirely self-referential process. Um, but so he conducted this and I received a letter in Latin saying in nominem sumum pontificem and then going blah 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 um, and a whole lot of complicated things in Latin. And I later discovered that they only, they only send you this document in Latin if they don't really mind whether you pay any attention to it or not. They have the same document for firing priests in all the languages. Um, but if they want you to take cognizance of it and obey it, they send it to you in your own language. <laughs> if they want it to be on the books that they've done it, they send it to you in Latin. <laughs> so anyhow, I got it in Latin, which apparently means, ah, OK, we've done our bit. Um, but anyhow, it's still pretty depressing to be told you can't preach or teach even in an Episcopalian church. That's, um, uh, uh, because theor uh, theoretically, they say, no, you can't talk in any ecumenical setting to any of that. Um, so I was pretty upset with this, but I spoke to my former novice master, who was a bishop in Mexico, and who'd known me since I was knee high to a grasshopper. And um, he said, oh, James, this is too stupid. Pay no attention. Um, he said, don't bother to write to the Holy Father because it'll never get through because of filters and all of that. He said, I will go, like, like our nice prodigal son, in, I will go to my father's house. No, he said, I will, I will go and seek a private audience with the Holy Father, and I will ask him to sort you out. So I was absolutely delighted. The time came for his private audience. I wrote a, a letter telling uh, the Holy Father what had happened. Um, I had my Spanish corrected by a, a very well-lettered Spanish friend. Um, and the letter got to Raoul. He took the thing, had his interview with the Holy Father, and rang me up the day later and said, it's all, it's all fine, it's all... Uh, we had a good time. He didn't seem to be upset or annoyed that I'd raised this question with you. He understood the background completely. Something will happen, he said. So we didn't know what. 
two months later, as you mentioned, this phone number appears, hidden number. So it's, it's either the CIA or it's the Holy Father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the Holy Father. Um, um, so things like this, literally, it says, Soy el Papa Francisco. So I said, En serio? Uh, in Spanish, that's, uh, I am Pope Francis. And I said, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> And he said, no, in Roma, hijo. No, just kidding, son. <laughs> uh, but it was he, as I could tell by the Argentinian accent, and more specifically by the fact that he had my letter in front of him and was uh, reading from it and talked about friends in common. And then he said, listen, uh, all this fuss. I said, I want you to walk with great interior freedom following the spirit of Jesus, and I give you the power of the keys. Do you understand? I give you the power of the keys. So I said, yes, I understood. And uh, we chatted a little bit more, and then he, he hung up. Um, and I, so I asked a leading canon lawyer what this meant. And apparently the power of the keys in Catholic talk means the ability to preach and hear confessions. Anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. Well, that's the point is that that faculty is normally given by the bishop, the local ordinary, to priests who serve in the diocese. So you normally get your faculties from the ordinary. But so what this was, was the universal ordinary giving me universal faculties. Which means that I didn't have to ask Cardinal Winton, is that his name? Your local, your, ignorance. your local guy in Washington. I uh, have to ask his permission. I didn't have to ask his permission to come and talk to you. Uh, <laughs> today or even let him know. Uh, and I could hear all of your confessions validly. Um, however, let us, uh, I'm sure you have, you have Jeffrey and Emily and other wonderful people to do that. So. Well, <laughs> we got to see some of your wonderful sense of humor as a result of that inquiry, so thank you. Now, I want to get on to some hermeneutics, but I, but I think that we could start by noting that you discovered René and you discovered his works. René Girard, and that formed the basis of uh, your construction of that whole systematic uh, theology. Can you just briefly tell us the elements of René's work and how that gets connected to right. uh, the, the fact that insofar as the post-resurrection uh, followers of Jesus were concerned, the scales fell from their eyes as a result of, 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 of this addiction to mimetic uh, desire. Right. Yes, I, I first came across uh, René Girard's thought, thought in 1985, and it was a complete revelation for me. His thought consists of, it's really a single insight uh, with three elements. The, the first element is the, as you referred to, the mimetic nature of desire. What does that mean? It means that we are essentially imitators. What we, are, what we do better than other apes is imitate. <laughs> we tend to think of monkeys and chimpanzees in particular as very good imitators. They are, but they're nothing like as good imitators as we are. <laughs> We are so good at imitating that we don't even notice we're doing it half the time. If I were to yawn now, half of you would yawn within about 30 seconds. Quite literally. And you wouldn't be able to help yourselves uh, doing it. We all know that. We all know. We say, oh, it's contagious. Uh, we all have what are now called mirror neurons. Um, and as we see other people doing things, it fires the, the doing of the thing off in us. Why is that important? It means that other people fire us off. <laughs> We are not self-starters. We love to think of ourselves as self-starters. And in fact, the whole of you know, like our pop psychology is based on the notion of us being self-starters. Individuals who are facing down a cruel world, trying to impose my imperial will. If I am a, what is it called, a grand wizard of a certain southern organization uh, upon, upon all of you. But that's not in fact how we work at all. We are fired into being by what is other than us, from our childhood onwards, from our infancy onwards. And this is a constant process of our being brought into being by what others do think want, such that 
we acquire a relatively stable sense of self over time and we acquire it stably in as far as we accept ourselves being imitators and don't go into rivalry with people. And that works pretty well while we're smaller than the people we're imitating and the, the closer we get to them in size and general capacity the more we're inclined not to want to be seen to be imitating them <laughs> and so we go into rivalry with them and this is called adolescence um, <laughs> amongst other things um, but anyhow the, the thing is that we are massively other started and that's something we usually forget so that's the first thing and that also means that ourselves are much more malleable than we like to think. Who we are is a much more fragile construct, much more capable of being altered by different currents of thought, of desire, of whatever. So we get swept up into things, thinking that it's we who are doing the moving, but in fact unaware of how much we are being moved and caught up in things that just happen to be going around. And this uh, is true of uh, consumerism, it's true of political movements, it's true of religious movements. <laughs> All of us are very easily moved into things that we think are us, but in fact are relatively easily alterable into other us's <laughs> by other patterns of desire being introduced into our network. One of the things about that is that while we are this malleable other driven thing, while we are not in rivalry with each other, actually this is very good. It means we can share a huge amount of information with each other. It's a very rich way of belonging. We, are, we can become aware of dangers. We can learn altogether how to avoid certain problems when we all share a good deal of our patterns of desire. If you look at doing it to us, this is the, this is the great thing. We go into rivalry and it's other people's fault. You started it is the great sign that this is going on. The word for it is scapegoat. Not yet. We haven't got there yet. But fairly soon, if you have an all against all, either you self-destruct or you coalesce around a wicked other, the other whose fault it is. So the scapegoat mechanism is when successfully the all against all has turned into an all against one. There will have been times when an all against all doesn't coalesce into an all against one, in which case the group self-destructs and its survivors, if any, go and join other troops of baboons or chimpanzees or whatever it is that we were. And of course one of the things that happens now in our modern world, because we're aware of scapegoating, is how difficult we find it not to go into self-destruction which is one of the things that we find ourselves uh, doing in relation to this. Now, what Girard noticed, having noticed how that structure of the scapegoat mechanism was found in all the myths of antiquity, both from the places where we usually get our mythical knowledge, you know, Greek and Hebrew myths, but also from ancient uh, Hindu myths, from Alaskan myths, from Ojibwe myths, from Nordic myths, from uh, Mesoamerican myths, from Aboriginal Australian myths, the same basic structure is to be found. And like a good French intellectual, he expected therefore that the Bible would be a collection of the same sort of myths. And lo and behold, it was, but with one curious exception. Or not so much exception as one curious difference. Whereas in all the ancient myths he came across, all were accounts of scapegoating told by the survivors, as you would expect. The scapegoated one doesn't survive, that's the whole point of them. <laughs> they were all accounts from the survivors in which somehow or other they, the group, was not responsible for what had happened, but some gods had had a squabble in their midst and had had to dismember someone in order to be able to give them the gift of fertility or yams or cattle or whatever it is that uh, was the basis of their, uh, of their society. And what Girard began to notice that in the Hebrew stories, although you get some of those, what you increasingly get is mythical stories told from the perspective of the one person whom it cannot be told by. 
which is the scapegoated one. Mm -hmm. The whole point of the scapegoated one is that they're not there. They don't get to tell the story. The official story is told by the survivors. And naturally, the survivors believe their own version that the scapegoated one was, was guilty and was responsible. And yet, at the very beginning of the Hebrew Scriptures, you have not God patting Cain on the back, as the gods patted Romulus on the back when he founded Rome. God doesn't pat Cain on the back and say, nasty business having to kill your brother, but you know, someone had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> We needed to found this place, get it all going. And really, you might be frightened to think of it as a murder, but don't worry, it was a sacrifice. Um, that's what the gods do with Romulus. But God in the Hebrew Scriptures does not do that. God says to Cain, where is your brother? His blood cries out to me from the ground. And poor old Cain then has to go and found civilization with a huge great question mark hanging over his uh, his head, such that God has actually got to protect him from being lynched by giving him the mark of Cain, which is not an accusatory sign, it's a protective sign. Because Cain says, how can I do anything? Because people will know what I've done and they will, they will seek to avenge me. And God says, I put the mark of Cain on you, that's to protect you. God understands that human foundations are sacrificial and that that is a based on murder, and the, the one thing that God needs to protect Cain against is spiralling vengeance. It doesn't work for very long, because within a couple of generations after Cain, they're killing 70 times 7. You kill 7 of mine, and I will kill 70 times 7 of yours. And then, of course, it all gets so violent that God has to draw a time out and flood everything and start again, as you remember. But anyhow, um, the point is that not only that story, but repeatedly throughout the Scriptures, you get the possibility of the cast out one speaking. What is the Joseph story but the Oedipus story told from the flip side? Someone who does not commit uh, incest, does, refuses to sleep with Potiphar's wife, having said, but Potiphar has treated me as a father. He has given me power over everything. How could I possibly sleep with his wife? In other words, the first ever denial of Freud is in the book of Genesis. Um, and then, just to show that the Hebrews understood exactly what they were doing, when Joseph has finally sorted out Pharaoh's little famine problem and got his brothers together and everything is nice, Pharaoh decides to give him a wife. And to whom, whom does he give him as a wife? The servant of the high priest, whose name is? The daughter of the high priest, Potiphera. In other words, someone of the right generation, so not incestuous. Do you see how they understood that? And of course, the basis of the whole story is about how Joseph and his brothers, although they were full of rivalry, and although, they had, although basically the whole thing was a bitch fest between them, refused to kill their father. The whole thing is, don't let the old man die. <laughs> if you send him back, if you don't allow jo Benjamin to go back, the old man will die in grief. And in fact, Joseph is a, I mean, Jake, Jacob is a grand old drama queen in, in that story. He spends the whole time saying, oh, if they will, I'll go and die. You know, he's constantly emotionally blackmailing the whole lot of them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they refuse to be drawn on that, and they refuse to allow him to die. So eventually he comes up and dies in dignity. The Oedipus story is undone quite deliberately and knowingly by the authors there. They under, understand how not to engage in the, in the mythical accusations. So you get these stories, the Job stories, the Psalms, the Suffering Servant. Time and time and time again, the impossible happens. The voice of the cast out one becomes the interpreting voice. And it's so, that. So the insight is that this condition is universal, universally present among humans. Among humans. And that the post-resurrection disciples who did not understand what Jesus was doing when they were living with him and living, working through it with him, suddenly realize, post-resurrection, a following set of facts, that Jesus' ministry was without anger, was without violence, was without separating people into categories, and 
was without death. Yes, and above all, without vengeance. Without vengeance, yeah. And that the scales had fallen from their eyes in such a significant way that they then proceeded to create what we know today as Christianity uh, by reporting uh, this new insight. So that's the basis of, of your systematic theology. Now, could we, what I'd like to do I don't want to stop you. No, no, that's fine. What I'd like to do is cite some biblical stories that have troubled me in one way or another and ask you for some hermeneutics uh, in conformity with, it, with, this, with this wonderful view of, of, uh, of theology. And so I would start with the story of Jesus proceeding to Jerusalem. He has turned his face to Jerusalem the uh, disciples are going with them and they do not at this point understand what Jesus does understand. And he passes a fig tree and he sees that the fig tree is barren and it angers him. I use that word um, deliberately and he curses it. He proceeds into Jerusalem, the fig tree dies. Now, this story appears in all three synoptic Gospels. Therefore, the probability is that Jesus did this. And there is a theory, at least, that the fig tree is a symbol for Israel. And that Jesus' anger has to do with Israel's failure to understand what he's trying to do. Is that a legitimate interpretation? And if it is, how is the mind of Jesus without anger? Okay. Um, the, I'm going to take it from the Massian version, which is the one I know best. Uh, remember, in, in, in Matthew's Gospel, which we'll get on Palm Sunday, do you do, do, or will we have this year, will we have Luke's Gospel? Do you? It's Luke this year, including the, the, Jesus, the, the actual Palm Procession. Okay. Well, I, just because I'm in my memory, I remember the Matthew version more clearly. Uh, on Palm Sunday, Jesus comes in on a donkey with the palm leaves and all that, and he goes to the temple, um, and he starts what we call the cleansing of the temple. And it's uh, explained quite clearly the verses, uh, he explains a couple of verses, which is the formal sentence as it were, imagine a juridical act. But what he's actually doing is cleansing out the sellers uh, who are there. What he's doing is he's fulfilling the last verse of the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 14, I forget what the number of the verse is, but you look at it, it's either the last or the penultimate uh, verse in Zechariah. He's basically announcing, symbolically, the end of the temple because that's what Zechariah is talking about. Zechariah is talking, the last few chapters of the book of Zechariah are the coming of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord obviously is a, a day in a, a generous sense. <laughs> this involves enough things going on that uh, uh, we can't imagine them happening in 24 hours. But many of them are enacted by Jesus that week, <laughs> which is why our passion narrative is so full of references to the last four chapters of the, of the book of Zechariah. It's the arrival of that day. And it was understood at the time that one of the things that would happen in the 10th Jubilee, uh, the 10th Jubilee, the 10th period of 49 years after the refoundation of the temple, was that in the first week of years, so that's within the first nine years of the uh, Jubilee, week seven periods of uh, seven groups of nine years leading to 49. Um, in the first nine years of the, uh, the Jubilee, the Melchizedek high priest would come and perform the definitive sacrifice. And then at the end of the period, the temple would be destroyed or miraculously re, uh, recreated. So that was part of the prophetic background that everybody knew. This was the common uh, background, prophetic imagination at the time, which is why when Jesus, after Jesus has performed these signs in the temple, the authorities come and say to him, <laughs> uh, 
by what authority do you do these things and who has given you this authority? In other words, they understand perfectly well <laughs> what he has been enacting. He's been enacting the end of the temple. So the next day, after he's done all this and he uh, wanders around, looks, it says he looks at the, uh, the splendor of the temple, and then he goes back to Bethany for the night. And the next day, he comes in, and as you say, uh, the, he's cursed the fig tree on the, on the, way, on the way out of the night. And when they come, uh, come in the morning, it's, yeah. it's dead. So the image, as you say, is more to do with the temple than with Israel. Ah. And what was the particular thing? Um, fig trees were, had very, very abundant foliage. And the very abundant foliage was very important for them as uh, occupiers of sun space for them to be able to concentrate the sun on them so that they could produce good fruits. But what he had noticed was a fig tree which had abundant foliage but no fruits, and that was the sign of the temple. The temple was this very, very beautiful building, <laughs> which is the equivalent of abundant uh, foliage occupying the good space that ought to be occupied by other things, but was not producing fruit. So that was the sense in which the fig tree was. So he's saying uh, this, fig, this fig tree is going to be a sign of the temple. In other words, consider it caduc. Okay. <laughs> right. uh, which is exactly what he'd done the day before. And he then talks to them when they ask him about it. He then talks to them about, uh, if you say to this mountain, uh, be thrown into the sea. Of course, the mountain he's referring to is the Temple Mount. Be thrown into the sea, it will be. And from now on, the place of prayer, will, you know, wherever any of you pray together and wherever you uh, forgive each other. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that's not too long and pompous. Next up, <laughs> the, Jonian, the Jonian story of the upper room. And this is written long after the crucifixion. Uh, and yet it is reported in the scripture that the disciples are assembled in the upper room for fear of the Jews. What's going on there? Because again, the insight uh, that you produced in your systematic theology is that the disciples understood that Jesus was without uh, dividing without, without separating uh, people in the categories that, that was not a part of his yeah I think you make me you make me too progressive uh, I'm really quite a traditional Catholic uh, but, but let, let's, let's answer <laughs> let's answer that um, from their point of view it would initially have appeared to be tremendously divisive but it was producing signs of those who wanted the division and those who wanted to overcome the division. I think that's the, but let's look at that, that imagery. So they're gathered on the first night, uh, the first evening uh, after the resurrection. Um, and it says, for fear of the Jews. Now again, remember that everything in um, John's gospel is full of irony. It's way Full of irony, oh. everything in John's gospel. And that's a very important part of the Hebrew world. Um, this is something which I didn't understand until recently. Remember that the Hebrew language is, uh, was, is, uh, written without, was, written without vowels. It's only the consonants. And if you look at a, what we would now call the Jewish Bible, if you go to the lo local Jewish bookstore and buy a copy of the Bible, it will have the letters, which are consonants, and it will have the punctuation underneath, the marks, which are the vowels that are provided, the vowels that are traditionally provided. Well, the provision of the vowels uh, reached its current state in the eighth century of our era. It's what is called the Masoretic text, defined by the Masoretes, was the eighth century of the Christian era. Just, just to give you an idea of, of how recent the fixation of the vowels are. But the thing about many of the words can become word games and become puns depending on which vowel you supply. Uh, it's one of the things which is hugely significant and important for the interpretation of Christianity, remembering its Jewish roots. And this is particularly clear in John's Gospel, is how many bits of irony there are. So what we have in that uh, passage is these people gathered together in a room, and you might say for fear of the, what we, we would now say, the religious authorities of their time, because that's the word Jews in a non-ethnic sense, whereas we translate it in an, in an ethnic sense. So they're, they're afraid of the, yeah, 
whatever form of uh, religious party, partisan religious police uh, uh, there. But they're, they're gathered together in a room uh, which was closed for fear of the Jews. And it's into that room that there is about to appear Jesus. Not only Jesus, but the presence of the Most High. In other words, what is the irony? Was that there was one place that the Jews feared to enter. Ah. <laughs> Got it? Mm -hmm. It's, it's also where the Holy, where, where the Holy Spirit is. Where the Holy, where the, the Holy One was present. Yeah. Uh, and they were feared to enter it for the reason that the Holy One was present. Mm -hmm. uh, and only the high priest could enter once a year and with a cord round his ankle so that he could be yanked out if necessary. Um, uh, and that was a place that no one should go into. For fear. So this is, curiously, this is a secularization and an ironization of that because this is, in fact the maximum theophany of the whole of Scripture in the Johannine sense happens there. John 20, that is the maximum theophany. That is when the Most High appears finally and definitively. This is the form of the Most High that we've been building up to for hundreds of years. <laughs> appears in their midst and appears in an ordinary house and imbues them with the spirit which is going to make them thereafter the bearers of creation. There is going to be no more outside God. There is no, going to be no more above you, God. Now, as the Father has sent me, I have sent you. He breathes the Holy Spirit into them, uh, which is the same uh, Greek verb as breathing into Adam's nostrils in the beginning of Genesis. It is now, whomsoever you Forgive will be forgiven. Whomsoever you do not forgive will not be forgiven. In other words, opening up creation is now a purely horizontal exercise. The Most High is in your midst as the one empowering this and setting you free to take this forward. I hope that's a, an answer. One of the wonderful points in your theological arrangement is that it's the need in one's spiritual journey to get into the mind of Christ. And it seems to me that one place to go for that journey is the Sermon on the Mount. And so I, I bring up for you, for, for your wonderful hermeneutic, the thing that scares me the most in the Sermon on the Mount, just the final admonition, therefore be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's just mind-boggling to me, and it scares me. In fact, it scares me uh, to Isaiah 6-5. Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips. How do we stitch all this together so that we're happy <laughs> well, I think the very, first, the very first thing we do is we, we take the word perfect to the laundry um, because, it's, because it's a useless word in modern English because it means it, it uh, has, what's the word, connotations of perfectionism. Whereas for the, uh, in, both in the Greek and the Hebrew word, it's much more to do with being brought to completion. It's the notion, it's part of the creative process and meaning being brought to completion allow yourselves to be brought to the kind of completion which is what the Creator does. So, luckily, we have learned that it's only in as far as we recognize that we are people of unclean lips and all that, that we begin to start being able to be uh, completed at all, because God is not seeking uh, moral perfection in our sense. God is seeking people who will allow themselves to be brought into being. And that's the, uh, that's the thing. This is, a, this is a fairly classic definition, but if you want the uh, a classic definition of, of original sin and its uh, consequences in us. It's oh, would you go up to your thesis? I wrote my thesis, on. but but this is separate from that. This is, I hope less pompous than that. Um, <laughs> it's uh, uh, it's, <laughs> it's uh, a resistance to being brought into being. We hold on to semi-grasped identities rather than allowing ourselves to relax into being brought into being. Original sin is the, the grasping, being locked into an aversion to the process of being created. Why? Because the process of being created precisely is not concerned with how good or bad we are. 
but with our longing to be brought into being, our getting onto the inside of the adventure. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't find that, I don't find the verse frightening. I find it challenging because, you know, it's forgive your enemies, pray for those who, um, who uh, bless those who persecute you, pray for those who attack and all of that. Uh, thus you will be uh, children of your Father who is in heaven, uh, which is the, the perfection which is being described. But what that means, and this is, I think is the, goes to the question of the elder brother and the younger brother in the parable, is the forgiveness, the for loving our enemy and the forgiving is not a moralistic exercise of you must become doormats for Jesus uh, to allow the people to walk over you. In one sense, it's, uh, the first step is don't let the bastards get to you. Uh, and the second step is because you're not letting the bastards get to you, you're ceasing to be formed and run by the ill that is done to you. Start being towards them as your Father in heaven is, who is for them without being over against them in any way at all, who's not in rivalry with them. What does it mean for us to be able to let go of holding on to what the bastards have done to us as a way of getting a cheap identity, because at least it makes us feel that we are somebody and not nobody. <laughs> at, least, at least I know who I am when I'm in arms against them. Whereas if I were to let go of my enemy, who would I be? That's the great, the great thing. But stepping back from that and actually finding yourselves having the affection towards them so that you're not able, you're not over against them any longer but are able to be towards them without being in rivalry with them. Now that's, that is perfection. <laughs> and that I think is much more challenging than some notion of moral perfection that we're always going to, uh, because that's a complete shift of the whole of the center of gravity, if you like. Uh, something like that, does that? Very good. I Did Jesus have an occasional blip? Matthew 15, 24. Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. This is when he's talking to the Syrophoenician. Shortly thereafter, he's approached by a non-Jewish woman who seeks his help. And Jesus says, no. And the woman says, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Jesus immediately corrects himself, says, your faith has a miracle. Let it be done as you wish. But hearkening back to this image of the, of the post-resurrection disciples getting it, this is reported in the Gospels. It doesn't seem to get it. Is, in other words, is, is God open to a plea uh, which results in a reversal of the decision? Oh yes, I think that's a standard, uh, that's a standard feature uh, of God in the Hebrew Scriptures, but I don't think it's the right reading of, the, of that parable, but I, I don't want to get into an argument about it. But again, no, 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 I'm fo just, fo follow, following the Matthew, the Matthew version of that, I hadn't noticed this until recently, but if you look at that whole incident, he talks about uh, having been sent to the lost sheep of Israel to the disciples before the woman gets there. Um, and he appears to be setting up the disciples uh, for their attitude uh, to what is happening. And he then engages, engages in the discussion with her. They have, um, because they hear her crying from away, they hear her from crying. She's a She's an irritating crier out. So he's giving them a lesson uh, and then enacting something in their presence so that they get a sense uh -huh. of what's going on. And the, the key word is that kunarioi, uh, which because she uses the word kunarioi, which is very clever of her, kunari, the little dogs. It's not dogs, it's little dogs. As a French bulldog owner, I'm particularly sensitive to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to this. But the little dogs, was actually a standard way at the time of referring to in that part of Matthew's gospel. He's in the lands in between Jewish, purely Jewish lands and purely pagan lands. He's in the lands 
in which Joshua was supposed to have rooted out all the dwellers in the land. But Joshua had failed to do this, uh, which makes God cross in the book of Joshua. I forget how cross, I forget how many people he has to smite, but he does an awful lot of that in the book of Joshua. Um, but jo Joshua failed to root out all the people. So you had these little pockets of non-Jewish people in the midst of uh, Jewish people. And these were referred to as the Kunario, the little dogs. <laughs> they were, but it was the house. They were the ones who were, um, you know, pagans but are pagans. Uh, not, not the pagan nations, not, not the nations. So there was a, there was a strangely, um, what's the word? I, no doubt dysfunctional uh, family type relationship between these uh, places in that area. And it appears that that's being played with uh, uh, there. But the extraordinary thing is that she, in her first cries, it's all about her. But when he rebukes her, she makes it all about her daughter. And that's when it's, uh, that's, the suggestion is that it's when she stops making it all about her that he says, <laughs> um, that. anyhow, it's, it's a very, very subtle. Uh, uh, oh, it's a wonderful uh, hermeneutic. Uh, very, very subtle. Actually. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry that I don't have the text in time to, to do it more, but uh, I was alerted to that by a French friend of mine who goes through these, these texts very, very, very closely. Can we skate off into the ethers here with some non-biblical que theological questions? I am at your mercy, sir. More 21st century, <laughs> more 21st century type questions? It, it can be argued that the 21st century will be the century of science as the 20th century was the century of America by our hubris. Um, and science is leading us into some very troublesome and interesting places. We may be creating machines that act on their own. We are certainly going to be creating the capacity to mess around with the human genome is there a responsibility for Christian theology to deal with these questions? And if so, how should it deal with these questions? And who's thinking about it? Hmm. Well, there you have me well out of my depth. Um, I thought we were to sail off into the ether. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I'm ashamed to be not up to uh, the standard of that question. The one thing that I would hope that we might beginning, be beginning to learn. And I hope, strangely, that our experience of COVID and uh, the liturgical changes that it has made upon us remind us, which is that human bodiliness, which is, of course, is what makes us humans at all. We are, we are bodily projects. What does the soul, what, is, what does having a soul mean? It means this bodily project brought into being by God at a specific time and place. It doesn't mean that there's a ghost in the machine or anything like that. It means this bodily project. This bodily project which is held in being relationally by God. But that human embodiedness is a rather richer concept than we had imagined. <laughs> because we are now finding forms of wireless and internet embodiedness, which are no less human than this kind of bodily presence. Though we're inclined to think of them as less human, as it were, that this is natural presence and that is unnatural somehow presence. I just want to say there is nothing more natural for this human adventure than us finding different ways of togetherness which form us differently than we had expected. Ever since our first primate ancestors managed to stumble into symbolicity, which is what the first murder did, it made the first one that stood for all, or all that stood for one. <laughs> Which is when we entered the crisis 
and it really has been a crisis of which we are still in the hard to resolve phase of the fact that we are no longer run by our instincts but we are if you like at the sea of having to learn all the different forms of possible connectedness that our symbolic universe <laughs> creates for us. So what I hope is that as Christians we will be brave about this and not simply frightened by it. We will be brave about the hugely apparently invisible but weaker forms of togetherness We've been talking for ages about spiritual life. <laughs> Actually, if you want a good example of spiritual life, it's wireless internet. <laughs> it's togetherness that is invisible. But then all our togetherness has been invisible ever since we became desire run imitators and our ways of togetherness and apartness started being worked out invisibly but violently and therefore the whole question has been what is in between us and how can that build us up rather than destroy us and the definition of the holy spirit is in between god sideways god who is in between us what is it going to be like having the in between turned into something that is a sign of the kingdom. And that seems to me to be uh, the, the challenge. Reverend Sir, thank you very, very much for sharing yourself with us. Well, thank you very much. It's been me. a great privilege to have you here, and we're grateful for, for your sharing your knowledge and your sensitivity and your spirituality with us. Thank you for having me, sir. Thank you. Lunch. Oh, we have an announcement, I think. Oh, oh, sorry. It's, it's, it is lunch. Um, thank you for that, those words of, of nourishment for the soul. Now is nourishment for the body. Um, we will have lunch in Norse Hall. You go out the doors here, turn right, and on the left, next to the coffee is where lunch will be served. Um, those of you with name tags have lunches prepared, um, but it appears that we have additional uh, lunches that those of you who may not have uh, ordered ahead uh, by getting a name tag in advance uh, may be able to avail yourselves of. Uh, what I would ask is if you um, would wait a little bit behind those who have gotten lunches already, um, to get theirs. You can have your lunch in Noor's Hall. You can have your lunch out of Noor's Hall and outside uh, if you'd like to get fresh air. Um, but we will gather in Noor's Hall at 1 o'clock uh, for our afternoon session. So, feast and enjoy.